Football is by far America's most popular sport, and New York is by far America's most populous city. So you would think that the football stadium for both New York teams would be located in a central area within New York City that would be easily accessible by public transit. Wrong. MetLife Stadium is all the way in New Jersey, not New York. And if you were in Midtown Manhattan and wanted to get there on a game day, it would take about an hour to an hour and a half, and you would have to switch between two New Jersey transit lines. Compared to other stadiums from some place like Penn Station, Yankee Stadium is only a half hour train, City Field 40 minutes, Barclays Center 20 minutes, and Madison Square Garden a three minute walk. Getting into the stadium isn't that hard. It takes about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes to take that New Jersey transit line, but getting out is a pain in the butt. Because the track capacity is not that much, security will have you wait on this long line just to get onto a train, which could take about a half hour to an hour, depending on how full the crowd is. And, and while you're on this line, you're going to be thinking about how the Jets just blew a game to the New England Patriots because they called John Franklin Myers on a roughing the passer where it wasn't really that bad, and they should have gotten a pick six and gone up by 17 points at the half, but instead, it was roughing the pass. The Patriots got a field goal, and then they beat you because they always beat you. They've beaten you since you're 15. They've beaten you your whole life. Ugh. So let's say you wanted to avoid this annoying train and train line. Well, parking is about $65 a game in 2023. You can't walk because that would take three hours to get to the George Washington Bridge. And ride sharing has congestion pricing, which increases the rates to astronomical levels after game day and also has an hour long line. Why did this happen? Why is the most popular sport all the way over the Hudson River? It didn't used to be like this. In the early 1970s, both the Giants and the Jets played their games in New York with the Giants at Yankee Stadium and the Jets at Shea Stadium. But by the mid-1980s, the only football team New York State had left was the Buffalo Bills, and both teams had abandoned New York City as their home stadium for a swamp in New Jersey. How the heck did that happen? Back in the early 20th century, football used to take a massive backseat to baseball, especially in New York, where the Giants, Dodgers, and Yankees competed for World Series championships consistently throughout the 1950s. The first football team in New York City history was the New York Football Giants, created in 1925. The name of the team directly piggybacked off the other fan base in the city, the New York Baseball Giants, who were a very successful team. This was not exclusive to New York. The Pittsburgh Steelers were originally called the Pittsburgh Pirates to mimic the baseball team's name, and the Chicago Bears were named to partner with their Wrigley Field counterparts, the Chicago Cubs. The New York football giants played where the baseball giants did for 25 years, in the polo grounds. Then they moved to Yankee Stadium, which had a bit more capacity. With the polo grounds vacant, a new upstart football league called the AFL had started in 1960, and one of its founding members was the Titans of New York, who took it over for the inaugural season in 1960. But the team, along with the fledgling AFL, was losing money, and it took new investors, new ownership, and a new stadium plan to change the name and move them to Queens. They would move to Shea Stadium, and if you ever went to Shea Stadium, you might know that you could never hear yourself think for about three and a half hours because of the constant thingies above your head because it's right next to LaGuardia Airport. What were those thingies called, though? Even though Jets are super cool, the Jets have consistently not used Jets in their logo for almost their entire history. It'd be like if the Vikings were called the Vikings, but instead of their logo being a Viking, it was just the word Vikings. At Shea Stadium, the Jets always played second fiddle to the team that rhymed with them, the Mets. As the Miracle Mets were wrapping up their historical season, the Jets played their first five games on the road in 1969 to avoid conflicts with the baseball season. Then they played seven straight home games and then two on the road to finish. The Giants didn't ha always have to deal with this scheduling conflict back at Yankee Stadium, but they were interested in getting their own stadium from New York City and began negotiating with Mayor John Lindsay in the early 1970s. Yankee Stadium was also set to undergo massive renovations and would not be playable for much of the mid-70s. New York City Mayor John Lindsay was haggling with the Mara family for less tax breaks when out of nowhere the Giants got a sweeter deal from the New Jersey Sports Authority and they publicly announced they were moving out of New York City in 1977 to go to a place called the Meadowlands. City officials and fans were shocked. The attitude of the Giants management has been selfish, callous, and ungrateful. 
New York City had 7 million people in the 1970s, roughly the same population of the whole state of New Jersey. To New Yorkers, Jersey is another world, one they don't enter except to see their grandma or the guy from Cake Boss, but it's to be avoided at all costs. The fact that a team was moving there was baffling. While Yankee Stadium was being renovated in the mid-70s, the Giants had to move all the way to Connecticut and play their games at the Yale Bowl. Built in 1914, the Yale Bowl didn't have a locker room or proper facilities for an NFL team and all tickets were just $8. Seeing that the Yale Bowl really wasn't ideal, the Giants agreed to move back to New York City until their stadium was finished and they occupied Shea Stadium in 1975. Along with the Yankees, who were also there because the Yankee Stadium was under repair, the Jets and the Mets. This is the only time in American professional sports history where four separate professional teams occupied one stadium. In 76, the Giants Stadium called Giants Stadium was finally finished and the Giants moved in. With all the vitriol coming from the city of New York towards the Giants, the Giants took the NY off their helmets and made it say, Giants instead. They didn't change their formal name though, because while New Jerseyans might root for a team called New York, New York fans would never root for a team called New Jersey. Therefore, they remained the New York Giants. Shea Stadium for the Jets was loud, unruly, and chaotic. It was there in the upper deck that the iconic J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets chant was born, when board fans ran around the upper deck trying to get people to shape the letters. However, despite the charm, Jets owner Leon Hess also wanted an upgraded stadium much like the Maris from the city of New York. The Shea Stadium bathrooms were always gross and Jets owner Leon Hess couldn't stand it. Additionally, the Jets had a bad deal with the New York Mets. Whenever the Mets made the playoffs, they could promptly kick the Jets out for all of September and October. And the Mets also got money from the Jets hot dog and parking sales. Mayor Ed Koch had also never attended a Jets game in his six-year tenure as mayor, which upset Hess. And when negotiations started out and Hess said he wanted Shea Stadium to be upgraded for football, Koch dragged his feet and Hess decided to do the same thing the Giants did and moved over the Hudson to Giants Stadium. The Jets now played in a stadium that was named for a different team, and their training facility was still located in Uniondale on Long Island. Every Saturday, the Jets would get in buses and drive all the way down to the Meadowlands before a game. In reading documents on how both Mayor Lindsay and Mayor Koch handled the negotiations between the Giants and the Jets, it seems rather quaint. Both have very annoyed press conferences when both the teams leave and talk about the duty that the teams have to the, to the fans to provide fair prices and not use public funds. It's all kind of quaint because nowadays cities like Las Vegas will cough up almost a billion dollars before a team even officially moves to their city just to lure an NFL team. But the NFL wasn't as popular in the 80s as it is today. So both New York City mayors lost the teams to New Jersey. In an open letter to Hess, Koch also mentions that the city of New York would start negotiating with other NFL teams to move into the city. In reporting at the time, there's also rumors that a USFL team would move into Shea. But when that league started in the spring of 1983, New Jersey Generals owner Donald Trump, who would go on to do nothing of significance, decided also to play his games at the Meadowlands. The rumors of another NFL team moving to New York City also died down, and there has not been a National Football League game played in the city of New York since 1983. The tension between New York and New Jersey still existed between the teams and where they played. When the Giants were on the doorstep of winning their first Super Bowl, Mayor Ed Koch said he would not hold a ticker tape parade if they win in the Canyon of Heroes in Lower Manhattan. I don't think uh, that New Yorkers want to take hard-earned taxpayers' money and spend it on a foreign team. The Giants did win the Super Bowl, and instead of the parade in Manhattan, they just had a little ceremony at Giants Stadium in East Rutherford, and that was all. This foreign team used to have on, their, on the side of their helmets, uh, NY, you remember that? They took it off. Giants players were not happy with Kosh's ramblings to the press. It made the story not about the team's success and more about city and state politics. Jersey is Jersey. New York is New York. Let Governor Kane finance the uh, ticker tape parade in Menachee. The Jets were not the main tenants of Giant Stadium and always felt like they were playing second fiddle and one at their own place. There was one plan to bring them back into New York, and not just in Queens, but in the heart of the city, right on 34th Street. Mayor Mike Bloomberg had an idea. Out of the ashes of September 11th, New York City could show the world it was back on a public stage. 
What better way to show this than to host the 2012 Summer Olympics? When Bloomberg announced this plan, city residents and journalists were a bit confused. Is this a joke? For non-New Yorkers, the city can barely handle a 5 p.m. rush hour, which often goes lead into the night. How are we going to add millions of people and host the Olympics for an entire summer, given how bad traffic already is? Additionally, New York doesn't have field space. It's a densely populated mess of sprawling metropolises and subway stops. Building big things, hosting big events is not what the city's made for. A centerpiece of the plan was to build a West Side Stadium at modern day Hudson Yards and the New York Jets would have put up $800 million along with New York City and New York State to build the project. Ultimately, the construction of the stadium along with the Olympic bid failed to garner support from state and city politicians and the Jets remained at Giants Stadium until it closed in 2010. The Jets and Giants then jointly built MetLife Stadium together where they were both 50-50 co-tenants. MetLife was built right next to the old Giants Stadium and both teams remain in New Jersey to this day. The year after MetLife Stadium was built, the Giants won the Super Bowl and this time Mayor Bloomberg made sure it was a parade in Lower Manhattan. The problem with MetLife Stadium is that it sucks in every way imaginable. Architecturally, NFL stadiums are kind of cool because they're built with the team they're hosting in mind. The Buccaneers have a massive pirate ship in one of their end zones. The New England Patriots have a lighthouse built into their stadium. And the Minnesota Vikings have an awesome gattle horn where they go before every game. But MetLife Stadium was built for two teams, so most of the unique architecture had to be replaceable. So while the walls change from blue to green, the lighting in the stadium changed from blue to green, and the retired numbers and the Super Bowl championships also change, the basic fabric of the stadium can't, and it's left a palish grayish that's super depressing to walk into and be around. The stadium didn't even have the team's logos in, the, in midfield until the 2023 season when they got new turf. Before then, it was just the NFL logo, the only two teams in the entire league to do that. It also just looks like an air conditioner and compared to other stadiums built around the same time, lacks in creativity on a massive level. Look at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, built two years before MetLife. It's got this brick facade, this awesome lighting with windows. MetLife is just gray and blah. And it's not like a stadium that's used by two NFL teams couldn't look cool. In 2020, SoFi Stadium opened in Los Angeles and now hosts the Rams and the Chargers, and it looks awesome. It's got this awesome white roof, hosted the Super Bowl two years ago, and it's got this sweet scoreboard ring in the middle of it. So we're left in this weird situation. On September 11th, the Buffalo Bills played the New York Jets. On many schedules, this may appear Buffalo versus New York which is weird because Buffalo is New York and New York isn't New York, it's New Jersey. And even though both the teams play in New Jersey, they're still both called New York. So while the stadium is super hard to get to and the state of New Jersey spent $1.6 billion to build an air conditioning, MetLife Stadium still gathers 80,000 people on fall Sundays to watch our team suck and blow every chance of hope imaginable all the time.